Good morning, everyone. How's everybody today? Well, as I said to some people, I think I have humidity brain today. Um, I don't mind the heat at all. It's just humidity that seeps in, and sometimes things don't function quite as well as they should. So, so anybody else ever feel like that, that humidity just kind of does that? So yeah, okay, a few of you know what I'm talking about. So, so just bear with me on that. So. It's good to see everybody here today. Welcome to whoa, whoa, whoa. see humidity brain. <laughs> I forgot there was a microphone there. Um, welcome to those who are joining at home as well. So we will go over our announcements for today. I will get to the picnic in just a second, um, but for things that are coming up this week besides the regularly scheduled things, on both Tuesday and Friday we have our softball games. Um, 8 o'clock on Tuesday is Malden United Methodist versus ours, and then on Friday at 6.30, um, Princeton Bible Church against us. Um, these are the last games of the regular season, so if you like to go or if you've always wanted to head to one of the softball games and, and cheer the team on, you're welcome to to do so on Tuesday and Friday. And on Wednesday of this week, we have our youth group at the Parsonage. Um, so just remember at 6.30, anybody from 6th grade through 12th grade or recently graduated, welcome to come um, for that. A big thank you from the United Women in Faith or the United Methodist Women. Um, because I'll just read what, what Julie wrote. A huge thank you to our wonderful church family for your support, baking, working, buying, and praying for the bake sale that happened um, last week. Thanks to God for the cool morning and for delaying the rain until right after we were done. A special thanks to our great supporter, Charlie Gbeck for setting up the tables and helping with the cleanup. We earned $492 for missions. So thank you very much to everybody who, who um, baked for the bake sale and for those who came out and, and bought. It was greatly appreciated. Change the World funds for July, those funds that are put in the large um, uh, container on the table outside of the, the sanctuary, goes to Buddy Bags this month, a program that feeds the needy kids here in Princeton for the weekends during the school year. So this is building up their coffers so that they have enough money for um, this next year. So we want to make sure everybody knows that you are invited to the all-church picnic today. This is an annual event. Um, we didn't have it for one of the years during COVID, but we had it last year and had a great time. This year, it's at Zering Park. It is today at 12 noon. Everybody is invited. It doesn't matter whether you're a member or not. We just want everybody in the church to come. We will be supplying pretty much all of the food. Hamburgers, hot dogs, buns, condiments, water bottles, cheese, coleslaw, potato salad, potato chips, all of that. If you want to bring a dessert or an appetizer, you're welcome to, but you do not need to. There should be enough food um, otherwise that we're pre preparing to be able to have for everybody. We plan to eat about 12 noon. Again, these we have reserved the two shelters at Zering Park on the south end of town. Um, if you can, please bring your own table service and a lawn chair if you want to stay and watch the games. There will be games afterwards. You do not need to have signed up for anything. Just come. We would love to have you um, attend today starting at 12 noon at Zering Park. The youth group will also be having um, a, the bake sale at lunch in the park this coming Friday. Because we all know I am a horrible cook, and um, I don't know if we want our junior hires baking either, um, we need some help with getting some food items um, for this bake sale. So if anybody's willing to make something for the bake sale this Friday, um, please do so. You can bring it in either on Thursday or early on Friday, and um, we would love to be able to, to help to have that available. Um, all the money will go to help our youth group funds. And just a couple of others. Marsha is on vacation this week, our, our administrative assistant. If we, I think we still need um, somebody to, to be in the office on Thursday and Friday mornings. If, if anybody wants to, please let me know. The Prairie South Summer Late Academy is coming up Saturday, July 23rd and 30th. Please contact Marsha if you're interested. And choir is starting back up this fall. Um, we would like to have at least seven or eight people to make it a go. We hope to begin practicing on August 31st, and then our first singing Sunday would be September 11th. So if you're interested, please let Karen Newby, our director, know, um, and she'll be explaining a 
little bit more about it, I think, next week as well. So just keep that in mind. Okay, I believe those are our announcements. Oh, yes. Oh, sure. So the other thing is, if we're going to have a choir, we have to have someone to play the piano for it. <laughs> so, so we are currently in the, in the, um, uh, the process of getting a choir accompanist. So if anybody knows of anybody or you yourself play the piano really well, it shouldn't, it, it, it's Wednesday night practices and then twice a month on Sundays. So, so if you can think of anybody who might be interested, it is paid. So we would love to be able to have a new choir accompanist. Okay. Thank you. Kind of forgot about that one. Thanks for sneaking in, Reed. Good to see you. <laughs> I knew you were trying really hard there, so. <laughs> if you'll please bow your heads with me for our focusing prayer. This week, it was written by the 4th century theologian, St. Augustine. God of life, there are days when the burdens we carry chafe our shoulders and wear us down. When the road seems dreary and endless, the sky is gray and threatening. When our lives have no music in them and when our hearts are lonely and our souls have lost their courage. So flood the path with light, we beseech thee. Turn our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. It is through Christ that we pray. Amen. And now if you are able, if you would please stand as we join Ben in our responsive call to worship. Come, people of faith, trust in the Lord's steadfast love. Take refuge under God's ever-protective wings. We want to acknowledge God first in our lives. We seek to rely on a power beyond ourselves. Know that Christ our Savior is the image of the invisible God, the one in whom the fullness of the divine was pleased to dwell. We are the church gathered in his name. We are the body of Christ, seeking to live faithfully. And if you'll remain standing as you're able, as we have our opening hymn, it's number 467 in the hymnal or on the screen, Trust and Obey, and Charlie will be playing, and Courtney leading us in the singing. <laughs> Do his good will, he abides with 
And you may be seated all except for the kids if they'd like to come up. Are you guys happy today? Well, um, Hannah, you don't have to... You what? You did the secret entrance. Okay. Hannah, would you like to come up a little closer here? We don't have to be separated today, okay? You came a little closer there, didn't you? Okay. Here we go. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Okay. Well, don't, don't leave me, though. <laughs> okay. So, guys, what do I have right here? Your money. It's a $10 bill. Is that a lot of money? Kinda. When I was your age, that was a huge amount of money. It really was. Nowadays, it's probably not so much, but it can still be used for a lot of good things. So, I, I want to ask your opinion on two things. What would you use this money to buy? Would you use it to buy a new songbook or hymnal for the sanctuary so that people could sing out of it? Or would you use it to purchase a meal for somebody who's hungry? Both. You can only, a hymnal costs at least $10. There's no way. And with food prices these days, I don't think $5 is going to get you much either. So if you had to choose one or the other, which would you do? Feed somebody or let somebody sing praises to God? What's your vote? Praise to God. What's yours, Hannah? If you had to pick one. Well, I, I, we, I'll let you speak at the end, but I need, I, what would your answer be? To help people who are hungry or to help people sing praises to God? Which would your vote be? <laughs> Food. Okay, well, see, even right here, we have a difference of opinion, okay? So, here's the thing. How many, let's, do you want to ask them? Do you want to ask them? Let's see what, how many people, whether they would, Use this $10 to buy a hymnal or a hamburger, okay? Ask them to raise their hands if they want to buy a hymnal. <laughs> for a hymnal, for a hymnal. Okay, a few. What, now ask for a hamburger. <laughs> oh, most people would buy the hamburger. Okay, interesting. <laughs> it's okay. You know, both things are very good. This is a really tough choice to make, guys. It really is because God wants us to serve others, but he also wants us to praise him. So it's important to feed the hungry, which we could do with this money, but it's equally important to feed our spirits by singing and praying and listening to God's word. So, Aiden, your choice of singing to God with a hymnal is very important. Hannah, your choice of buying a hamburger for somebody who's really hungry is very important as well. In the scripture reading for today, we're going to hear about the story of Mary and Martha, who were two friends of Jesus, and they had the same, same disagreement on what they should be doing. Which one do you think God said was more important, singing or feeding? Which one? No. Singing. Jesus would have sided with you on this one, Aiden. And we're going to talk about that more in the big people's sermon, okay? So in this case, Jesus gave his approval to Mary. But I would say that we always need to focus our attention on God and Jesus. Sometimes that means helping others. Sometimes it means praising him. And sometimes when we sing, when we go to church, when our spirits are full, then we're able to better feed the hungry around us in many ways. So just remember... We can use this $10 to do both things very well. And you know what I'm going to do with this $10? I'm going to put it in the offering so that the church can figure out what they want to do with it. How's that? Okay. Thanks so much. Yes, go ahead if it's quick. Mom could get Netflix on her iPad. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Well, just to let you know, I'm not putting the $10 toward Netflix, though. So, <laughs> thanks so much, guys. <laughs> <laughs> she always has an announcement to make. That's really fun. So, so this uh, we had our, our Saturday evening contemporary service last night. Um, so I decided to do something just a little bit different today. We wanted to. We were going to have some special music today, but unfortunately, illness um, caused that not to happen. That um, the Knicks twins will be able to do that in August now. So I decided to put in something that's called the Nicene Creed. How many of you remember the Nicene Creed, or at least have heard of it? Okay. 
But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you just a bit of background because we don't do a lot of creeds in this church, and I want to explain what it is. A creed is a doctrinal statement of what the church states is the correct belief. It is used to correct bad theology or to help people be on the same page um, and have people know what is right, what is wrong. It's an attempt to unify people in what they believe. Sometimes creeds have been used to distinguish between believers and heretics in the church. I'm not going to use that today. The Nicene Creed was developed first in 325 AD, and the amended version that we'll be reading together was finalized in 381 AD. So it's been around for a long time. It was developed a little later than the shorter Apostles' Creed in order to clear some things up and it included more information on the third part of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. The early church fathers met at the Council of Nicaea in 325. Nicaea was a prominent town in the country of Bithynia, or modern-day Turkey, bordering on the Black Sea. It was the first effort ever to develop theological consensus in all of Christianity. It didn't stick, <laughs> but it was a good effort. About 300 bishops throughout the world attended, and they worked together to find what they all agreed on in their faith. It regards Jesus as equal with God, which was a hot topic back then. The Nicene Creed was the defining statement of belief for mainstream Christianity for many centuries. Most Protestant and Catholic denominations still agree to its principles. And for many years, converts to our faith would have to memorize and proclaim this whole creed in public in order to join a church. So we will, I'm not going to have you do it from memory, because I don't think I could either. So we are now going to join together, if you will, in the reciting of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and who the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So again, for centuries now, that has been the defining understanding of what pretty much all Christians believe. And now we will have our scripture readings for today. The first of these comes from Colossians, and I'll invite Ben to come forward as he reads that for us. I'll be reading Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, 
the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his Christ. cross. Thank you. And if you are able, if you'd please rise as we hear our gospel lesson for today. This is Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself. Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. This is a very famous passage, of course. Um, People talk about this one all the time. And it's a very difficult passage for me to preach on because it is the exact opposite of how I think things should be. I am definitely a Martha. I work hard to make sure things turn out the way they're supposed to. I would much rather be busy doing something than just sitting around. I don't like disorganization. Although one look at my office right now says I'm a bit hypocritical on that topic. And I believe most things are done best if they are prepared for ahead of time. It takes hard work and planning for things to turn out right. There are probably those in this congregation who would disagree with me on that. And I know I'll be proven wrong many times by their effective extemporaneous work in the future. So this is how I know that God is good and authors both ways of doing things. Life can end up fine whether you prepare or you don't. But in my defense, I come from a long line of what we would term Marthas. So it's simply what I'm used to. Most of the significant adult females in my childhood would have been considered neat freaks or at least very tidy homemakers. My mother and grandmother never allowed piles of stuff lying around. My brother and I constantly had chores to do, both inside and out. In the summertime before we could play with the neighbor kids, we had to pick up our daily quota of sticks and or weeds. The yard always looked neat, but to this day, I detest picking stuff up. Remember, I lived in the middle of a pine tree forest. There were sticks falling every day. My aunts are also wonderful hostesses. Whenever they host family gatherings, everything is planned to the finest detail, including the color of the napkin and even take-home treats specific to the holiday. Even my one aunt's mother-in-law kept an immaculate house, and her name actually was Martha. So biologically, I think I was destined to be one who likes order and wants to keep chaos to a minimum although I am certainly not a host like they are. For the 4th of July this year, which I hosted, we ate off of Christmas-themed plates. They were clean. That was important. The biblical figure of Martha fits exactly the role of a first-century Jewish woman, someone who cooked, cleaned, and raised children. In that culture, if you did that well, you were considered a successful female. At that time, there wasn't much of a chance for you to break out of that pattern. So the women in my family would have been considered perfect examples of womanhood back then. That is why in today's gospel lesson, Martha gets so upset with Mary. She's not doing her part, and she's not doing what women were supposed to do. But that's also why it's so scandalous that Jesus states that not Martha but Mary is the one doing the right thing in this case. What Mary was doing was actually disgraceful. She leaves her proper position in the kitchen and sits at the feet of Jesus, just like a man. 
She's out of place. She's out of order. For only the men were allowed to relax and learn like that. And Jesus condones it. What is he doing? Doesn't he know this will upset the whole order of things? Either Jesus has gone mad, or there is a lesson here somewhere. And truthfully, this understanding of Mary's behavior being better than Martha's is somewhat shocking for us in the church today as well. Why? Because whether we admit it or not, the vast majority of us in the church have Martha's temperament, whether we're male or female. We work hard to make life's many pieces fit together, to be good and gracious people. We fit into the rules society says we should. We believe we can make the world a better place by being organized and working together to make a difference. Simply put, the typical church is full of doers. And that understanding begins literally at home. According to the New York Times, at the end of 2006, the sale of home organizing products had reached over $6 billion per year. By 2020, the amount was $10 billion a year, and experts predict that by 2025, sales of bins and baskets to hanging storage and party pantry organizers will reach $13.5 billion a year. The pandemic exacerbated this situation. Closets Magazine estimates that the companies that make just plain closet organizing systems will make $3 billion per year. I just think it's amazing there's a Closets Magazine. <laughs> I can't imagine this is too thrilling of a read, but it's probably full of practical tips. And to top it all off, its home office is located in Lincolnshire, Illinois, only about 130 miles from here. But we know that people can get obsessed with having their home organized just as they can let clutter overwhelm them. What I think God wants us to learn from the story of Martha and Mary is to know that there needs to be a balance between time spent working hard and time spent in relaxed learning and listening. You can almost imagine the scene in the house that day so many years ago. You see Martha running around like crazy. She's frantic, trying to get everything put together so this gathering with their very important guest will be perfect. And before all is ready, her sister just quits and sits. Martha knows there's more to accomplish, so she's not having any of that. She complains directly to Jesus. He's going to set Mary straight. He'll let her know what she's supposed to do. Mary's not fulfilling her duties, and we all know what happens when a job that needs to be done doesn't. One day, a man came home from work to find total mayhem. The kids were outside, still in their pajamas, playing in the mud. There were empty food boxes and wrappers all around. As he proceeded into the house, he found an even bigger mess. Dishes piled on the counter, dog food spilled on the floor. The family room was strewn with toys and various articles of clothing. A lamp had been knocked over. He headed up the stairs, stepping over the toys to look for his wife. He was worried she was ill or something bad had happened. He found her in the bedroom, still in bed with her pajamas on, reading a book. She looked up at him, smiled, and asked how his day went. He looked at her rather bewilderedly and asked, What happened here today? She again smiled and answered, Well, you know every day when you come home from work and ask me what I did all day long? Well, today, I didn't do it. <laughs> of course, this takes away nothing from the hard work that those who work outside the home do. But it is saying that work around the house and with kids is difficult and important. It is not just bonbons and soap operas. All types of duties should be honored and respected. But while we all know certain tasks must be accomplished, so must relaxation and learning. So how are we to know when it's time to give that priority? First, I think it's very important to realize when we're feeling burned out from all the hard work that we do. This is one of the reasons God gave us a Sabbath day. 
Yes, we were created with gifts and talents to do good works for God, others, and ourselves, but we were also made to rest. All that work can tire us out. Our physical bodies need time to recuperate. Our problem today is that even on a day off from our paying job, we're still running around like crazy, trying to get all those errands done before we repeat the same process over again the next day. We're still working on our day off. I know that's certainly way too true as part of my life. But that's not what the Lord had in mind with giving us a Sabbath. The Sabbath is to be a time of rest, to intently worship the Lord, and to learn and grow. It's not just play, it's not doing errands, but actually resting. Very few of us actually take the time to do that nowadays. It would be good for all of us if we got back to it. Secondly, we can all use some more practice getting back to the main course of life. And what do I mean by that? Well, listen to a different translation of this passage from the message version of the Bible. This is verses 20, I'm sorry, 41 and 42. The master said, Martha, dear Martha, you are fussing too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. Only one thing is essential. Mary has chosen it. It's the main course, and it won't be taken away from her. So according to that translation, what is the highest priority? It's getting to know Jesus. He is the main course. And how do we accomplish growing in this highest priority? By both listening and living out what we learn. Working for God in the church is very good indeed. But when it becomes the main goal or a substitute for growing in God, we've got a problem. If we have to be busy all the time, if we're seeking accolades for what we do, or if we think that listening and studying are just a waste of time, then we really aren't paying attention to the main course. Our priorities aren't in the right order anymore. We need to recall what the disciples did. In, yes, doing good deeds, but they also sat at the feet of the master, learning what to do next. And in order to accomplish more of what God asks us to do, we all need to re-examine our lives to see where we're at on this. We need to reassess whether God is among our highest priorities, if not the highest. And we also need to see if what we're accomplishing in life is providing a balance in our faith. Are we so heavenly-minded that we're no earthly good? Are we so centered on devotional activities and Bible studies that we forget to help our fellow human beings? Are we forgetting to put what we've been learning into practice? Or are we so busy doing good things for others that we ignore what God's actually trying to say to us? Are we so busy go, go, going that we don't take the time to learn new ways of love and understanding that God wants us to experience? There must be a balance between these two. The main course of knowing Jesus is most important, and God helps to us to achieve it in many ways. So it is all right to let our lives get a bit unorganized, to not have everything be prearranged and perfect. That allows God's Spirit to move and provide inspiration, creativity, and learning in ways we wouldn't otherwise seek out. That can be hard for many of us. But if we can allow for a little more movement in our schedules by the divine, God will honor that and allow us to do even more than before. If we do that, we'll be making Jesus Christ a top priority, even higher than the organization of our closets. For me, this happens most often with funerals. Unlike weddings, people usually don't schedule their funerals with me ahead of time. They just kind of pop up and have to be dealt with. So I've learned patience and flexibility through having these important events come up that I can't control. And that's when hopefully the Holy Spirit moves through me and allows me to do a good job in putting together that service that celebrates a life. 
Thankfully, this can happen with any of us and at any time. When we allow God to move in our lives, we open our ears to what Jesus is saying to us in worship, devotions, Bible studies. We don't tell Jesus what we think we should be doing. When we allow God to move in our lives, we open our calendars to what God wants us to do. We don't limit our church participation and other spiritual activities to only Sunday mornings. When we allow God to move in our lives, we open our wallets to what the Holy Spirit asks us to support. We don't just confine our charitable giving to whatever crumbs are left over. And when we allow God to move in our lives, We open our eyes to the new person in our midst, whether in our pew or neighborhood, and the new needs that require attention, whether that's helping with cleaning in the church or a neighbor whose house recently burned down. To close the sermon this morning, I'm going to share a perspective from Stephanie Fry, a female clergy who I think gets it. There must be a balance between Martha and Mary in this life, in order to truly do what God asks of us. A woman in the parish I serve commented that she never likes hearing this text preached because she always comes away with the sense that it is never possible to get things right. If, like Martha, she works hard, she'll be labeled overfunctioning. If, like Mary, she sits and listens too long, nothing gets done. Giuseppe Belli's 19th century sonnet, Martha and Magdalene, ends with Martha snapping back at Jesus when he tells her that Mary's choice is more important. This is a really interesting statement. This, of course, is, is fiction, but it's a retelling of what might have happened from Mary, Martha's perspective. This is her voice. So says you, Jesus, but I know better. Listen, if I sat around on my salvation the way she does, who'd keep this house together? Thinking of God's word as the main course in the feast of life, however, doesn't give the sense that listening is better than doing. Rather, it places these activities in balance. Whereas the corporate world reminds us to keep the main thing the main thing, Christians are urged to remember that the main course is just that— the main course. Jesus is the host, not Martha, not Mary, not any of us. He spreads the word like a banquet to nourish and strengthen us. God's word has within it commands to both sit and listen and to go and do. We sit on our salvation, as the sonnet has it, but then we scatter into the world and do the work of daily life. In our quest to be more balanced in our Christianity, to truly make the main course most important in our life, we can't stop everyday organization or let everyday needs spiral out of control. For instance, I can't just decide to run off to a retreat center and take a vow of silence for an entire year, although some might be pretty happy if that happened. In addition to letting God's Holy Spirit move through our lives, We still have to provide healthy food for our families, pay the bills on time, file our taxes, take the dog for a walk. Becoming more balanced shouldn't prevent us from doing what must be done to live right. That does take organization and hard work. But if we can put these things in their proper perspective and balance, living life, helping ourselves and others, and growing in our spiritual nature, we will have chosen the better part. We will have chosen the main course, and we will be made better because of it. Amen. And at this time, I'll invite Courtney and Charlie to lead us in our next hymn, the first two verses of number 352, It's Me, It's Me, O Lord. We'll sing the refrain at the beginning and then at the end as well.
I will be sharing the joys and concerns that we have for this week. Um, I do want to say, because I neglected last week, to say a big thank you to all those who came out for the work day um, last Saturday, not yesterday, but a week ago. I think we had about 15 to 20 people come out, and we got a lot accomplished. So thank you to everyone who did that. And I also have to say a big, I don't want to, but a big congratulations to Gary Patterson. He's the one that won the croquet tournament last week. So you can take your bow, Gary, if you would like. So, oh, he actually is. <laughs> okay, okay, that's enough. Um, <laughs> but, but for our first annual croquet tournament, we had about 30 people come to the parsonage. And thanks to everyone who brought the food, um, I think we had a really good time. And we had a good number of people who played, but Gary ended up winning. It was close. There, there were a lot of people tailing him. Yes, it was close, Gary, but you still prevailed. So... <laughs> Yes, there was a lot of trash talk, too, I will tell you. For, for being a church event in croquet, there was a lot of trash talk. So, <laughs> so I'd like to lift up a, a few other things. Actually, I've got a bunch of notes here. We wanted to li There were actually, I think, three um, youngsters born into families in our congregation this past week, which was wonderful. So we first of all lift up Rich and Vicki Mayer. Um, they are grandparents again. Adeline Johnson was born on July 11th, and Vicki got to spend a lot of time with them this week, and everybody's doing well? Good. Very glad to hear that. We also want to lift up that... Um, that uh, Crystal and Randy are grandparents again, as along with um, Grandma Cindy and Steve and great grandma Anna Roadhouse. Um, Hunter Warren Pleasant was born to Alyssa and Jonathan Pleasant, nine pounds, six ounces. So big baby, everybody doing well? Very good, very good. Glad to hear that. And um, Rob and Val Horace have a new grandson, Hayes Golden Harris. I've never heard of the middle name of Golden, but that's really interesting. Hayes Golden was born to parents Nick and Megan and big brother Emmett this week. So congratulations to all of the families. Um, we continue to keep John Prins in our prayers. Um, he had spinal surgery this week, and he came through it very well, and he told me that he was released yesterday from the hospital. So there's a good amount of recovery that will, of course, happen, but John, I'm pretty sure you're watching from home. Congratulations on making it through, and we're so grateful we will continue to lift you up for recovery prayers. We have a lot of people in our congregation who either have gotten COVID this week, um, who are recovering from it, or have um, uh, relatives that are recovering from it. So we, there's just almost too many to name. It certainly has made a resurgence in our community. So please be careful, and we lift up our prayers for all those dealing with it. Okay, well, we lift up your family then as well, Cheryl. Thanks. Jeannie and John Guin's family friends, they also had um, a new baby born, Rylan, and her, we lift up Rylan and the parents. There were some health issues there, but seems to be coming along okay. Trent Goodale's mom, Elizabeth, um, was diagnosed with cancer this week, so we lift up her. And Janelle Goodale's aunt, Wanda, who we have been praying for, has some more cancer appointments, so we, we lift them up. Pat Etheridge's son, John David, was in the hospital this week, but he's better now and has been released, so that's wonderful. And we continue to pray for Darla. Um, um, that is your niece? Your niece, uh, who continues to not feel well having to deal with radiation. We lift up Charlotte Tournier. She has been moved around a lot at a Perian home. So just prayers that she can handle all these adjustments, having to go from room to room. We also are grateful that Arlene Peters, after having some health issues, is back at home, and she was actually here at the service last night. Um, the Haywards, um, Bob and Ruth, would like to lift up their um, granddaughter, Kate, and her husband, Vince. They both have COVID and are feeling very badly at this time. I also want to lift up Melda Pritchard. Um, she was going to be here. Um, she's the one who's over 100 years old and was going to be here last night, but she got sick. Um, so prayers for you, Melda, that you feel better. Josh Bush is having some iron infusions this week and has an upcoming CT scan. I want to say a big congratulations to the Orwigs. They had the 4-H fair was this week, and Jack certainly let me know that he became 
a grand champion twice for his pigs and one reserve champion, so congratulations to him. And then Reed, you were the senior, what? Uncon well, we don't need to know that. He was the senior showmanship um, winner at the 4-H fair. So, and that was for what? Just you're the super senior. Okay, very cool. Well, congratulations. So that's pretty cool. So, And I would like to take just, I think we've got time. I want to, uh, I actually meant to do this, but I didn't have all their email addresses, but as you know, in this church, we have what's called the Zeering Scholarship. And the Zeering Scholarship was made possible by the Zeering family a long time ago. And typically, we give out money and for college scholarships to one person, um, a graduating senior who's going on to a um, to an higher education level. We had this was our year to have all kinds of our seniors. They truly all are super seniors um, this year. But we have very active ones and five very active ones who all applied. And in talking with Mr. John Hecker, who's the one that makes the decision, trying to make a decision, we decided that we could not make a decision. And so three of the five are here today. And uh, John Hecker will be coming um, in the next coming weeks, hopefully to be able to give out these checks. But we decided to give all five of them $500 for their, for their education. So. So Courtney Atkinson is here, um, Reed Orwig in the balcony, and Jenna Loftus is running the PowerPoint. You all will be getting $500 along with Maggie Davis and Trent Goodale. So, so congratulations to all five of you. We just could not make a decision between you, and we felt that it was important to be able to share that joy. So, but we will be expecting you to come and get your checks later on. So, <laughs> but congratulations. If you'll please bow your heads with me for the pastoral prayer, then we'll say our Lord's Prayer together. As the world rushes by, O oh God, we want to slow down and find meaning in you. In this age of constant information, may we stop, listen, and empty ourselves to find the simple and true message that it is your love for every human being that matters. Create in us a place that is not touched by the world, that calls us to rush, hurry, consume, and satisfy all our wants. Lord, simplify our desires so that they become one with your desires for us. And when we are weary, give us the strength to find the quiet place that renews us for the days ahead. Hear us now, Lord, that in your mercy we may know that you are working hard on the joys and concerns you've heard us lift to you. We know you work all things toward the good, so we trust your process. Help us to understand your ways and believe that you are always walking with us. In your goodness, we pray all this, along with the words that our Savior taught all of his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I take the time right now to say thank you to all those who give of their time and talent in the church, those who are Marthas, um, who, who are willing to take the gifts that they've been given and work them to the good through, um, through the church here on earth. Marys also are needed because they're what keep our prayers going, and hopefully you are a combination of both of those, but right now I thank you, thank especially the Marthas who do the work in within the church, and we appreciate that. And for those that give money to the church, we also say thank you. And if you are here in the church today, you are welcome to put any offerings for our ministries into the, the plates that are at the exits of the sanctuary. For those of you who are joining us at home, you're welcome to send it into the, mail it into the office, drop it off in the locked box outside the main doors of the church, or give through PayPal. All is truly appreciated. 
If you'll please bow your heads with me for our offering prayer, and then we'll join Courtney in singing the doxology. Through our offerings, loving God, we proclaim Christ to the world. We dedicate all that we're giving to the preaching, teaching, and outreach that can move people towards your love. We offer ourselves along with our money, knowing you can do amazing work with our gifts and our lives. Amen. verses of hymn number 715, Rejoice, the Lord is King. the service today. Bruce is running the soundboard. Josh is doing the live stream. Jenna back at the PowerPoint. Uh, we had Jeannie and Julie put together the PowerPoint. Courtney and Charlie, of course, led us in the beautiful music. Thanks to Ben for being the liturgist and, um, and to anyone else who helped. We appreciate it. Um, so we really, we only have a few cookies out there for, um, along with the beverages for social time today because we do have the, the, uh, Picnic, thank you. I forgot what the name of it was. That thing where you gather outside to eat food, I guess, <laughs> for the picnic. Again, please, everyone is invited. We have plenty of food um, starting at noon o'clock. Noon o'clock. <laughs> like I said, humidity brain. Sorry, I got through most of it at least. So 12 o'clock noon at Zering Park in the shelters. Um, 
Last I looked, it looked like it was going to not rain, but we're under the shelters anyway. Hopefully we'll have the chance to get outside the shelters and have some games afterwards, but please, everyone is invited. We'd love to have as many people out there as possible. So now, if you'll please hear our benediction. God gives us the chance to go and do all kinds of things in this world. We've been given amazing talents and gifts, but God also wants us to sit, to listen to him, and be able to hear what it is that we are supposed to be doing. Allow us, Lord, to be both Martha's and Mary's. Allow that understanding to be made manifest in our lives. Let us listen and do. Go in the peace, love, and joy of our Lord. Amen.